you know, I'm having bloody diarrhea right now. Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed on your exam. Welcome to the Inside the Board Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 2 and Shelf Exams Internal Medicine Edition. In today's episode, Stuart gets a little personal, as you heard at the beginning there. Nah, I'm just kidding. I pulled that quote completely out of context, really for no reason at all. It's a GI episode, so he was just commenting on a vignette, which is what we do here at Inside the Boards. This one is jam-packed with study tips on how to approach USMLE standardized medical uh, education exam questions, so I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thanks to Online MedEd for providing the content for today's show. You know, our All Audio QBank Step 2 edition is powered by Online MedEd. So thank you, Dustin, Jamie, and everyone at Online MedEd, which, by the way, if you haven't yet signed up for OME, please click the link in the show notes to do so because it helps us out. Um, we're getting into some GI questions today. It's Dr. Ted O'Connell, our chief content officer, and our own Stuart Bryant, whom you know well, our chief podcasting officer. I am Patrick Beeman, but I'm not that important for this episode, so let's get right into it. My name's Stuart Bryant, and I am here with Dr. Ted O'Connell. And we are here for the Inside the Boards Study Smarter Series podcast. I think today we're going to cover some GI questions and try to give you a little deep dive into a couple of things that I think are kind of important for the exam. We'll skip the introductions and just kind of dive in. So the first question here is a 44-year-old female is evaluated for an eight-month history of abdominal pain. It is crampy in nature comes and goes unrelated to food, and is associated with daily loose bowel movements. The bowel movements seem to relieve the pain. There's no nocturnal bowel movements, melena, or hematochesia. There have never been any episodes of nausea or vomiting. Vital signs are normal. Physical exam reveals mild diffuse abdominal tenderness without peritoneal signs. The rectal exam is normal. Labs reveal a normal thyroid function and a normal CBC. Which of the following is the next best step in management of this patient? A. Colonoscopy with biopsy. B. Test and treatment for H. pylori. C. Tissue transglutaminase antibody. Or D. Review of history for depression. Let's walk through kind of how you would go about dissecting this question. So in, in this case, the patient has all of the typical signs and symptoms that you would find with irritable bowel syndrome. She has a um, pain that is vague and crampy and that's quite diffuse, and it's relieved with bowel movements, which is a real key point here. So what you're saying is you think this patient has IBS. Yes, that is right. So in that case, the next best step, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to rule out any other causes of IBS or anything else that could be similar to IBS, correct? That is correct. For me, that picks the tissue transglutaminase antibody as the next best <laughs> diagnostic study to run for this patient. What I'm interested in is do they have something similar and kind of insidious, uh, like IBS, that could be contributing to their their disease presentation, right? Yes. And one of the important things to realize with irritable bowel syndrome is it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. So we do need to rule out things like celiac disease. Right. And that's what tissue transglutaminase, the antibody, is going to be looking for. Um, there are some differences between IBS and celiac, both are going to have the diarrhea and abdominal pain. 
when I think of celiac disease, I think of the IgA antibody. I think about that they may have some other extra GI presentations like weight loss, anemia, and then we think about doing a biopsy or looking more in depth to figure out do they have pathology in their GI tract, right? That's right. And, and you can also think about things like rashes with celiac disease, oral lesions, oral stomatitis, a lot of different types of symptoms. With irritable bowel syndrome, you're thinking more along the lines, as you said, of abdominal pain or diarrhea or constipation, which are really the three predominant types of irritable bowel syndrome, although there can be overlap and mixed types. Right. And they can kind of go back and forward or be more of a constipative or more of a diarrhea type um, if you get into the, the weeds a little bit with that diagnosis, right? Right. So what are some of these other choices really going to be looking more into finding for us? So we have a colonoscopy here. Yeah. And a colonoscopy um, with biopsy would be indicated if the bowel movements were bloody uh, or if there were a stool gap. Really, this is going after medical diseases, the cause of the diarrhea, things like ulcerative colitis, Crohn disease, microscopic colitis. Uh, but these diseases are not relieved with bowel movements. Ulcerative colitis typically has blood associated with the stools. Crohn disease does not. And before concluding the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, um, she would warrant a colonoscopy, as we said earlier, rule out other potential causes. And IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, but, exactly. beca but because a blood test for celiac disease is pretty non-invasive and a colonoscopy is is much more invasive and costly, it would not be the next best step. Right. We're going to start with a sensitive test and move to, towards something more specific as our, uh, as our diagnosis and differential evolves. Another one here is to treat and look, test and treating for H. pylori. When I think of this answer, it, it's kind of uh, on you world, you'll, if you pick something that's kind of out in left field, it'll say something to the effect of, you know, you may see diarrhea in a very small and, you know, vanishingly insignificant portion of patients with H. pylori. However, it would never be the correct first step in, in the management of this case, right? That's correct. And I would argue that they, because it's so unusual that they probably would not be testing along those lines. Exactly. So, and, and UWorld likes to teach that way by letting you know that what you've picked is a kind of an interesting, interesting uh, answer choice given uh, the entire presentation for a patient. Trust me, just the way they design UWorld, that's not hard to do. So don't feel bad if you're out there listening and you've done that because I do it all the time because you kind of latch on to one diagnosis when they're giving you a lot of different information uh, to, to reconcile. And then the last one here is to look at a history of, for depression. This one's going to be more along the lines of, I guess, your history and physical, which are, which is going to be important when you're first seeing the patient. Is it the easiest thing to do? Probably. And could it be related to IBS? Yes. But I think it's going to distract from you ruling out underlying disease here. Uh, if you go ahead and jump to IBS as your diagnosis, then you've kind of closed off your, your differential and closed off your mind to looking at what else could be going on. Uh, and you might be writing off something that could be treatable, correct? Right on. Okay. I think we did a pretty good job with that. Let's go ahead and move on. Do you have any other th thoughts on this? No, I think that's good. I'll read this one if you want. We're just going to take a quick break to tell you about our sponsor, Common Bond. So you may have noticed a few more sponsorships lately. Common Bond is one of our supporters. Uh, they're excited to announce a new in-school loan for medical students designed to save you thousands of dollars over the federal Grad Plus loan. Just for background, the current federal Grad Plus loan carries a 7.6 interest rate and a four and a quarter origination fee. What most don't realize is that the federal government offers the same interest rate to all students in graduate degree programs. 
But medical students, you're not the average grad student. So the one size fits all approach doesn't quite work. And Common Bond decided to change it up. Why? Because you guys have great potential. The loan's interest rate starts at 5.56% and only carries a 2% origination fee. Importantly, I know this is all like the practical stuff you really don't want to think about, even though you're paying, you know, like $100 an hour to be in medical school, sit around, watch residents write notes and put in orders. Sometimes they don't even talk to you. But saving money is truly a big deal. To learn more, go to commonbond.co slash ITB. And thanks for supporting our sponsors. And now let's return to Stuart and Ted's discussion of these GI questions. So the next question is a 32-year-old female presents for evaluation of her chronic diarrhea. She has struggled with the diarrhea for almost 10 years. She is physically fit and works as a personal trainer. Despite different diets over the years, her diarrhea has not improved. The patient has not had any unintentional weight loss and reports feeling well overall. Her vital signs are normal. On physical exam, there is a cluster of vesicular lesions on her nose. Labs reveal a microcytic anemia and the presence of IgA antibodies against tissue transglutaminase. What is the next best step in diagnosing this patient? Is it A, antiviral therapy with acyclovir, B, endoscopic biopsy, C, start a gluten-free diet, or D, supplement pancreatic enzymes? Okay, so I'm going to attack this question a little differently from how most people probably would. We can go through both ways. But when I read this question here and it says, what is the next best step in diagnosing this patient? Very rarely in medicine, unless you're house MD, do we diagnose a patient with the treatment for a disease. Now, that is a a way to verify your diagnosis, but that's not really the way we're going to go about diagnosing. So three of these options uh, right off the bat are not diagnostic. They are therapeutic in nature. Antiviral therapy, gluten-free diet, and supplementing pancreatic enzymes are all therapeutic steps, while an endoscopic biopsy is going to be the only diagnostic study that we could run. I just want to point that out for the listeners because I think that is important for when you're thinking about what is the answer or what is the actual interrogative question trying to make me think about doing next. Here you see a patient who's got diarrhea, they have some anemia, they've given you, you know, based on our last question here, talking about the IgA antibody, we see that they probably have celiac disease. Now we need to say, okay, do we need to confirm they have celiac disease or should we treat them? And the question kind of does that for you. It asks you what's the next diagnostic step. So here, that's why I'm going to pick an endoscopic biopsy. I want to look for celiac disease because we've already tested positive. We've got the sensitive test to rule to rule out patients. So now we need a specific test to rule in this diagnosis, correct? That is correct. So in that case, we go do an endoscopic biopsy. What we'll see on that biopsy is usually villus atrophy or effacement of the villi. And then you may also find enlarged crypts or crypt hyperplasia. I really like that question just because I think there are two ways of really tackling it, and one of them is more of a test-based strategy. The other is more the actual medicine and knowledge, right? Right, and there's some real keys to here in this question, not necessarily to the right answer, but just to leading to the diagnosis of celiac disease. You know, they don't give us many lab results, but they put the tissue transglutaminase antibody right in there. They present us with a microcytic anemia, and we know that celiac disease affects the duodenum, leading to um, interference with iron absorption and a resulting microcytic anemia. And then there was the the point about the uh, vesicle on her nose, which might make you worried about HSV, 
Uh, but what it actually is, is dermatitis herpetiformis, which is a herpes-like rash uh, that can occur in patients with celiac disease. So a lot of um, kind of good learning just from reviewing this question. Exactly. Uh, and it, the, the answer choices really kind of point toward, you know, can I treat one of these things here? You know, uh, pancreatic enzymes, do they just have a general malabsorptive condition? Can I fix that and then everything go away? Or, you know, give acyclovir, get rid of the vesicular lesion? Or, you know, have I read this question? I think, oh, I see they have the IgA antibody against the transglutaminase. Okay, they must have celiac disease. Let's go ahead and start them on a gluten-free diet. In which case, you didn't really pay enough attention to the interrogative, which uh, I will grant in a third year level that that can be harder because usually they're all very similar. Um, it's like, what is the diagnosis? What is the next best step? It's easy to brush over that and just read the question and then just jump to your answer choice and move on. And, and you didn't quite pick up on where, where the uh, actual interrogative question was going. So a lot of good little, little tidbits in that question, I think. The next question here is a 23-year-old female presents with a four-month history of bloody stools. She's had diarrhea, often noticing blood on the toilet paper. The patient has no past medical history and takes no medications. Her vital signs are normal. On physical exam, she has mild tenderness in the left lower quadrant and bloody stool in the rectum. A sigmoidoscopy reveals inflammation of the rectum and descending colon. There are no crypt abscesses seen on biopsy. Which of the following is the next best step in managing this patient? Is it A, cyclosporin, B, mesalamine, C, prednisone, or D, surgical resection of the affected segments? So what are your thoughts here? Well, my thoughts, Stuart, I think in approaching this question, the first step is to try to make a diagnosis of what's going on. And, and with this four-month history of bloody stools, uh, diarrhea, abdominal tenderness, and then the, the findings on the uh, sigmoidoscopy, uh, we can come to the conclusion that she likely has ulcerative colitis. And then the next branch point in the thinking is, is this, how, how significant is this ulcerative colitis? Is it a kind of a mild chronic issue or is she having an acute flare? And in an acute flare, typically more abdominal pain, potentially unstable vital signs. We know her vital signs were normal. And then you can see active crypt abscesses, which she does not have. So we can come to the conclusion that this is more of a mild, more chronic ulcerative colitis as opposed to a flare. And so with that, we can reasonably rule out answer choice C, which is prednisone, because that is usually what is used for, for acute flares. Then getting into the other answers here, with the cyclosporin, um, that's a pretty strong immunosuppressant that has a lot of uh, side effects and toxicities. And so it's reserved for patients who don't respond to other therapies first. And the main medical therapy for mild ulcerative colitis is a 5-amino salicylate drug such as mesalamine or sulfasalazine, which would make answer choice B quite attractive for us. And with this mild disease, I think it's quite reasonable to say that she's not a surgical candidate and that she would not be looking at a, a surgical resection at this point. And so I would go with answer choice B, mesalamine. I really like that approach. I think it really addresses all the important aspects of this. So cyclosporin is a very big gun immunosuppressant drug, can have severe side effects for patients, and we typically aren't going to choose it. Prednisone is going to be a treatment of choice for a flare, right? We're trying to get rid of the active inflammation. This patient is having, you know, bloody stools, but they're not coming in with a severe looking picture. If anything, it doesn't really give you the impression that they're having, you know, I'm having bloody diarrhea right now. And they've just noticed it more occasional. And this is sort of your initial presentation of UC. So 
in that case, you're really not treating it like a flare. You're treating it as, you know, we first, we're making the diagnosis here and we're going to get you on therapy for the long term. Important aspects of UC, you know, it always kind of begins at the rectum and moves proximally. You don't get the like skip lesions that you think of with Crohn's. It's very like surface level, correct? Right. And then not like a, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to also add the, the very significant risk of colon cancer too. Exactly. Um, so what you'll get as I think after diagnosis, the, the typical, uh, waiting period is eight years before you start beginning screening colonoscopy, at which point you're, you're looking for colon cancer and, and then you're making the decision. Is it time to go ahead and do a, a surgical resection and ilioanal anastomosis or a colostomy in this kind of patient, right? Right. Do you want to go over a comparison of, of Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis? That's kind of a classic batch of things to, to talk about. I love that. I'll leave it up to you here because here's there. I have two thoughts on this. One thought is I think that it always gets batched together and people tend to think of it like that. The other thought is sometimes people get them confused because they learn both every time they learn about one. Yeah. So it's up to you. Where are we here? Since this was the question we were thinking about maybe not including, right? Uh, let's let's yeah, sk- let's, let's skip. just make it easy. I, I think that's a, a fair fair way to do it just because my personal preference is that when you're learning one, you're kind of learning the other one by not thinking too much about it. Right. For an auditory listener particularly, that's more test-taking strategy than anything. Yeah. The only thing we might want to go back and I think you said the timing of onset of screening colonoscopy is at eight years. And I don't know that that with UC, I think the risk is so high. I don't know that that's actually, I think eight years is kind of the cutoff where they go like your risk is really high. We should be thinking about surgery. After diagnosis or after the first eight. So my thought was after eight, then you started doing them. By the AAFP, they say patients should receive their initial colonoscopy eight years after onset. And that's after pancolitis. So yeah, I think it is eight. Yeah. And then follow up every two to three. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm happy with that. Yep. I think I'm ready to jump on this next one. So our final question here is a bit more of a doozy. Uh, We have a 58 year old female with a long history of hepatitis C admitted for hematemesis. She has been vomiting bright red blood for the past four hours. She has no other medical history, takes no medications, and to date has not had any hepatic encephalopathy, varices, or ascites. After stabilization in the emergency department with IV access and blood transfusions, her vitals are 37 degrees Celsius, heart rate of 110, blood pressure of 96 over 44, and respirations of 24. Her physical exam is positive for ascites and blood stains in her mouth. An endoscope is performed and reveals bleeding varices, which are banded and the bleeding stops. Hemoglobin stabilizes in the next 12 hours. Her most recent is a hemoglobin of 8. What is the next best step in management of this patient? Is it Bosepravir, a liver transplant, ceftriaxone, or blood transfusion. So what are your thoughts here? Well, what we know is that this patient has new onset ascites and uh, she's having GI bleeding. And so in terms of just general management of this patient, the first step would be to stabilize her. That is not one of the choices. And we know that that has already been done in the emergency department. If you're thinking about this also from a management standpoint, the next step after that likely would be to make sure that you're getting serial hemoglobins because of the GI bleed. But we have the information in this question that they have been doing that and her hemoglobin has stabilized over the course of uh, the initial evaluation and management. In the setting of a GI bleed with ascites, um, the ascites does have an increased risk of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And so putting her on empiric antibiotics would be 
the correct choice. A third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone is a great choice. The other answers here, you want to kind of run through some of these, Stuart? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you're na- you nailed it. So ceftriaxone is going to be great for our SBP. It's going to have good gram negative coverage. Uh, and we're going to want that just in case. So when I think of a patient with ascites, I kind of have a, a pretty short uh, differential, especially a patient with a history of hepatitis or uh, any sort of hepatic insult. This patient here has hep C, and clearly they've got some portal hypertension kind of picture here as well. And my differential for them is going to be SBP, SBP, SBP. And then I'm going to think of maybe malignant ascites, cirrhotic portal hypertension, but Chiari picture, malignant pancreatic ascites. And then after that, you're kind of getting more, you know, fading returns like, like nephrotic or a heart failure kind of picture. So for me, getting them on antibiotics is going to be my first choice. Next thing here, you know, we're going to want to do, in, in reality, you're going to want to get a SAG, a serum albumin or serum ascites albumin gradient. That's going to be through paracentesis, right? Right. That's going to assess the amount of albumin in the ascites compared with the serum. And basically, I think it's like one, one or one point something is kind of your cutoff where if you have it over one, you're really thinking of like a portal hepatic picture. And if it's lower than that, you're thinking of all these other causes, right? Right. And the cutoff is, is 1.1 grams per deciliter on the SAG. Right. Maybe, maybe that's a little in the weeds, but I think it is kind of important for kind of figuring out how do you go down your differential? Are we looking at liver or not liver? And that the reason that uh, gradient is higher in a liver picture is because they have that portal hypertension kind of pushing out more fluid than, than protein. It's like a, a transudative picture for those patients. These other choices here. So Bosepravir, that's going to be a antiviral treatment for hep C, which might be helpful for this patient, but we've got to think more immediate than fixing their hep C. Um, so while that might be helpful, we need to get them, <laughs> they need to live. Uh, and if they have SVP, which can develop into sepsis, and then that can lead to death, that's more pressing and why we're interested in antibiotics more so than the antivirals, right? Right. And then likewise with the the liver transplant, that's more of a long-term solution for her. It's not something that's going to happen as a, as a next step. She's going to need to have an evaluation and get on the liver transplant list. It is ultimately what she'll need as a solution to her cirrhosis, um, but not what's going to happen during this immediate phase of hospitalization. Yeah, and it would be, I think it would be a bad choice for you to think that, oh, this patient's got a, a liver problem. What's the first thing I'm going to do? Let's transplant their liver. There's going to be something we're going to need to get done probably before that. In this case, there are multiple things, uh, like getting them on a list, right? Yes. And yeah, the last option here is getting a blood transfusion. So we've talked about like we're measuring their hemoglobins. We're concerned for like a continuing GI bleed, which could be the cause for them seeding their peritoneal cavity and causing the SBP. So we're going to measure that and we're probably going to give them fluids and blood as we need to, to kind of re- replete them. We always use a cutoff of seven for hemoglobin. Uh, I don't think some people might even let it go, may not guaranteed get a transfusion at seven. Seven to eight is this gray zone where you've really got to have a good reason to be giving someone blood. And then eight, I, I don't think I've ever heard of a situation where you would be giving like a blood transfusion with a hemoglobin of eight, unless they're actively bleeding in front of you. Right. Right. Or terrible coronary disease with active symptoms that you're attributing to the anemia, but 
for the purposes of the exam? No, I would not do that. And in a, and in a cirrhotic patient, transfusions will increase portal pressure, can increase the risk of re-bleeding from a varice. So you do not want to transfuse them above if their are hemoglobins above seven. Oh, that's a really interesting problem here. So giving a blood transfusion might actually exacerbate the problem here. Yes. And that would be a interesting um, answer choice, to say the least, if you want to make it worse. I did not know that. That's great to know. So I guess that re- raises the portal pressures. Okay. That's an interesting. So they had variceal bleeding, and that might actually cause that to start back up again, and you end up in a... Uh, a vicious cycle, right? Right. Don't top off your cirrhotics is the the rule of thumb. Good to know. Okay. Uh, Any other pearls here? No, I think we've uh, gone through that question pretty well. All right. I really appreciate you sitting down and talking with me here. And I think these are some good high quality questions for us. Have you done anything that's gotten published recently on the podcast? Pod, uh, no, I have not. I was I was on I was on the podcast with Patrick. Okay. Did y'all talk about just what you've done, like your litany of successes? And it was kind uh, of an introduction to I'm joining ITB and yeah, just background type of thing. Yep, and we will end it there. And yes, Dr. Ted O'Connell has joined ITB. He is our chief content officer which we are very excited about. You should have head over to our main channel uh, to listen to the interview we did um, introducing him to our ITB audience, and you can learn more about what he has done as an educator. But some highlights, he's written and edited over a dozen medical textbooks or review books, including Crush Step 1, both USMLE Step 2 and USMLE Step 3 Secrets. So we're excited to have somebody with his wealth of experience and know-how when it comes to medical education be on our team. So you will continue to hear more from Ted as we move forward as an organization. And on that note, we are launching a USMLE Step 2 Secrets podcast. It includes excerpts from Ted's book, USMLE Step 2 Secrets, as well as in-depth question dissections at the beginning of each show. Go to insidetheboards.com, sign up for our email list, and we will let you know when that first launches in the new Inside the Boards app, due out, you know, as I've been saying now for a month, but still, I, I swear it's legit, any day now. Thanks for listening. See you back next time. Happy studying. The music for today's podcast is by DJ Bezo. The track is King Jeff and his apprentice Bart. Elizabeth listened to this and said, (laughs) after I mentioned that he happens to be my son, that I should also mention that he's only 12 years old. So if you are so inclined, head over to SoundCloud and follow DJ Bezo. That's B-E-E-Z-O. You will certainly make a 12-year-old kid's day. And I would certainly appreciate it. As always, thanks for listening. 